So I'm going to uh, share with you a reflection on the new times, and I'm going to ask the Lord for his words. So I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians 3. There are many workers. The building is one. I could not, friends, speak to you as a spiritual persons, but as fleshy people, for you are still infants in Christ. I gave you milk and not solid food, for you were not ready for it, and up to now you cannot receive it, for you are still of the flesh. As long as there is jealousy and strife, what can I say but that you are at the level of the flesh and behave like ordinary people? While one says, I follow Paul, and the other, I follow Apollos, what are you but people still at a human level? But what is Apollos and what is Paul? They are ministers, and to them you believed, as it was given by the Lord to each of them. I planted Apollos' water, the plant, but God made it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who makes them plant, who makes the plant grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work to the same end, and the Lord will pay each according to his work. We are fellow workers with God, but you are God's field and building. So, when we speak about the new times, we have something very difficult to understand, and it's the word time. Uh, when we read St. Peter, and he speaks about time, he says, just to give us an idea of a spiritual time, he says, for God, one day is like a thousand years, a thousand years like a day. Meaning, don't even think about it. See, it's like we couldn't possibly figure it out. We, we couldn't relate humanly to a spiritual time because we couldn't, we couldn't count it. There's no way we could make it. So that's why God told us through Jesus that no one knows the end but God. So when we speak about the new times, we speak about Jesus because we have two, two, way, two ways of seeing time. One is the falling of original sin, which begins the end times. And begins the, uh, the falling begins the, uh, the times of, um, of uh, exile. We were sent into exile. And then the incarnation of Jesus begins the end times. So you notice that when we speak about new age, we know that there's nothing new about new age. And we call it new age. But what is new about new age? Nothing is new about it. It's actually very old. Because new age is the devil, is evil. New age is the falling into original sin. So new age is the beginning of the exile. That is the new age. So the new times is like the new, the, the, the new life is like Jesus Christ, the end times. The end times begin with the incarnation of Jesus. And then the Lord said, before this generation is over, all these things are going to come to pass. And then when we count generations humanly, you know how many generations have gone by since Jesus ascended to heaven? Hundreds of hundreds. But he mentioned only one generation before he will return. So you notice the difference between his, between his time and our time. There's no way we can compare it. So the new times we're speaking about is the times in Jesus Christ. Meaning, when you really embrace the faith as you're supposed to embrace it, for real, radically, then you begin to live the new times, which is endless times. Endless. Then you are outside human time, you are above mortality, and you embrace an immortal life. It's, it's a big difference. It's a big difference with the one that goes to the mirror and sees a decaying human body, every day looking uglier, like I said before, and the one that goes to the mirror and sees an eternal human being. Those are two different people. One is filled with hope and love and compassion, and the other one is filled with sadness, 
insecurity, is, is, a, is a person that is angry, and is a person that has no love. Because he's so concerned about death, he's so concerned about aging, he's so afraid, he's so vain, that it's all superficial and temporary. So it's a person that you couldn't possibly trust because it's a person that is doing anything to keep what is dying. So what, what good can, can come out of it? Nothing good can come out of a heart like that because you are so attached to temporary things and, and then you are not going to be able to be faithful because anything that will threat your attachments will be your enemy. And then who's the first enemy you have? God, because God is trying to take you away from your attachments. So he becomes a, an enemy. You notice people, when they lose a, a dear one, a loved one, sometimes they go against God. They will cry, and very gently they will say, I, why did God take my husband? Why did God take my son? So in a way, they are threatening God, threatening God, and they're also going against God, because God took their attachment away. So we have to understand how it works. It's like... When we are embracing the true sense of eternal life, then we are living the new times, the times in Jesus Christ, which is a new creation, is a whole new life, and we are embracing a new reality, a reality that is not a, a passing reality. It's a, it's a permanent reality, it's the real, real thing. Because if we focus on that, then we are, we are going to be reliable. You notice how friendships are reliable when we build them within Christ. See, friends that you meet within the faith are more likely to stay and to stay friends for a long time, if not forever. Friendships, relationships that you build within the world are more likely to fall apart because they are depending on worldly things. They are depending on material things, human affection, temporary relationships, so they don't last, because they don't have life. They only have a human expectation that is mortal, temporary, that is going to fade out. It's going to, it's going to come to pass. So everything we build within Christ remains forever. Sometimes things fall apart even within the church and within Christ because we are not faithful. That, that happens too. You notice how priests fall, fall out, you know, some priests fall away. They, some priests just, just crash, you know, they just stop being faithful. And some of us do, and don't come back. But everything that is built on the rock is, is very difficult. I mean, most likely it's going to stay, because the rock is the rock, and the rock is Christ. So if you're building in Christ, it's going to stay. So the New Times is about embracing the, the reality of the New Jerusalem in the heart. The vision of the new, the city of Jerusalem of, from above is a very important one to have. You know, St. Paul speaks about us being focused on the Jerusalem of above. He was speaking to the Hebrews, and all the Hebrews were focused on the Jerusalem from below, the Jerusalem from earth. And they were all um, working to defend the earthly Jerusalem, which is okay because in those times... Uh, before Jesus Christ, people were focusing on Jerusalem because those, that was the holy city for them and they were expecting the Messiah and they didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. So when St. Paul came along and converted, he was speaking to the Jews, to the ones that were not converted and the Gentiles. And he was telling them the Jerusalem that was to, for us to focus on was the Jerusalem from above, not the Jerusalem from below. As a matter of fact, he confirmed what Jesus told the apostles. He said, the Jerusalem from below is going to be wiped out. It's going to be destroyed. There is not a single rock that's going to stay above the other. They, they're going to be tear apart. And 60 years later, 70, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed after Jesus said that. So when St. Paul was alive, he, he, he went through the times when he began to, be, to collapse, you know, to be destroyed. At the end of his life, the whole thing was taking place, beginning to take place. So now we understand that we have to let go of the Jerusalem from below. And what is the Jerusalem from below? It's Egypt. See, we have to let go of this earthly dwelling as, as an attachment. We have to embrace the earthly dwelling as 
a, the construction of the foundation of an eternal life. So therefore, we have to focus on, on being people of God by striving every day for goodness, to become a better human being. That is the only, the only way we could possibly live our faith. If you look back a year and you find that today you're still the same person with the same problems and you haven't changed a bit, then you know you are stuck. You are anything but a person that is walking towards God. You are stuck with yourself. So you are more self than, than what God is asking you to be. God is asking you to be more, more God than a human being. You know, meaning, meaning God has to dwell in your heart in a way that you have to say, it's no longer I who lives, but Jesus who lives in me, like St. Paul says. I have to diminish so he can grow. And that should, should be our aim. We should always be focusing on that. How do you know how much of God is in your heart? The only way you could possibly know is how much you are loving. That's how much of God you have. So it's like you have a husband or a wife or children or friends or parents, uh, people at work. You have them around you. And then you ask yourself, how much do I really love them? How much do I really forgive them for what they are that I don't like? How much do I like and love my life? You know, sometimes I feel frustrated and blue. Sometimes I'm so negative. Sometimes I feel lost and confused and depressed and anxious. And, and so how much of that am I? Because you have to keep a balance. You have to find out how much of what you are. You know, it's like if, if you are darker than lighter, then you know that you have much more of yourself than of God in you. Because you see, the more of God in you, the more light, the more hope, the more mercy and compassion, the more simplicity. You are a basic human being, very basic, very humble, very nothing, nothingness in your heart. And then you are accessible to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is going to be able to dwell with a very simple human beings. Those that are very simple. People that are not assuming. People that are just very humble people. And those are the biggest instruments of the Holy Spirit. So understanding this, we will realize that everything we have been given on this earthly life is precious if we use it as a transitory tool. See, People around us are a teaching. If the circumstances of our life, any circumstance in our life is a big lesson, everything. Well, you know that uh, when we speak about, when we speak about uh, the experiences we have with family and friends and people around us, uh, we speak about a school, the school of souls. If we are treasuring life with God, if you live within God, God's law, and Jesus' teachings, then everything in your life, every circumstance in your life, every human being in your life, everything in your life is a teaching. It's a school. That's why earth is the school of souls. This is the school of souls. And we will capitalize. We will, we will treasure everything in our lives as a great teaching. And God wants us to understand that. We have to understand that everything we're doing is a pedagogy of God. You see, he who hasn't made a mistake has never worked. See, we learn from our mistakes. That's the only way we could. How could I become humble when I find my misery, when I realize my misery, and I say, I am such a miserable human being. I'm such a sinner. Look at me. I did it again. I went against my brother. I committed a sin against God. I, I again was uncharitable. I again was impure. I again lied. I again killed. I again did that and that. And then, then you understand that. And you go on your knees and repent. So that makes you humble. Because that makes you vulnerable. And that makes you, that makes you a real human being. That then you know you are aware. Then you stop being judgmental. You stop criticizing. You stop doubting. And you begin to be real. And to be real is to understand your nature and to understand that God glorifies himself in your human misery. And that is the greatest gift. You know, you see the picture of this donkey on Palm Sunday going with Jesus, right? And you know that donkey was convinced the whole party was for him. Because he's, he's not able... 
he, he just knows he's just a donkey, right? He's not going to know it's for Jesus, the whole thing. He's just walking around into Jerusalem saying, wow, they really like donkeys in this town, right? <laughs> he doesn't know it's Jesus on top of him, right? And, and a, lot of, a lot of people, a lot of us, when we are in church, when we are preaching, when we are counseling people, when we are speaking about God, we think we are the ones, right? We think we are, the, we are the ones that are doing it, and we forget. It's like sometimes we drop the book of the law on people's heads and, and begin. Sometimes when we have like a renewal of our faith, then we go and try to change our family overnight. And what we do, is we scare them away. We push them farther away from God because we become too heavy, you know, and uncharitable. And, and here is where we have to be careful. Because you see, the biggest message of the gospel is for us to bring the love of God to people. That is a real change. When I am more charitable, more compassionate, and more forgiving, and I can counsel people through my loving, not by my ideas or philosophies or, or experiences or whatever I have that I think is valuable to share with people. Because I, the most important thing to share with people is the love of, the love of God in my heart. You see, the love of God in my heart is my capability of forgiving. See, if I, when do I have time to listen to my neighbor when I have love? Because if not, I am impatient. If not, I, am unter and I don't have any tolerance at all. So I have no time for people. And what they're saying annoys me because I don't have time for anybody. So people's stories, people's needs, people's hurt is not important to me. So I don't have time for them. See, so when you really understand the gift of love from God, then you understand that you begin to have time for everybody. And you will be able to listen to everybody. And you will have, you will have the gift of answering what is right, what is, what is exactly right and loving from God. Because you will be an instrument of God. So the New Times is, is about embracing the gift of Christ in, in the fullness of, his, of the way. You know, it's like I can say I am renewed in the faith and I, I am more prayerful now. I stop fornicating. I stop lying. I stop uh, killing people's hope and killing people's ideas and, and just, just becoming an obstacle in people's realizations in life, people's ideas. So many things I kill. And I stopped doing all of that. Now I have tendencies to do all of these things all the time because I'm a sinner. And it will be with me as long as I have a flesh. But now I don't let go of my passions just like that. I just don't go for what is wrong just like that, like I used to do. Because I used to be loose. I used to have no, no refrains of anything. I will just let it go and do whatever my passion will lead me to do. But today, I am renewed in the spirit. I don't do that any longer. And when I fall, when I do, I confess, I repent, I feel bad. So that is like a renewal. That is like a being born again in the faith. It's going back into God. But that doesn't make you a holy person yet. You know, that will place you in a path of holiness. But that doesn't make, that doesn't make you holy. Because to be holy is to stay there in that path and fight to stay there all the time until you make it to the end, trying and fighting to be there all the time. Then you will achieve holiness at the end. So that's very important to understand. We are people that live in a holy path. But for us to be truly holy, we have to make it to the end, walking on the holy path. See, and that is very important to understand. If we know that, then we have compassion with one another. Because sometimes we demand from people that are walking on a holy path, we demand for them to be holy. That's why we are uncharitable to the priest. We are uncharitable to the religious people. We are uncharitable to people that are very committed with the church. Because we demand from them to be holy. And you see, that holiness can only be achieved at the end. We are in the path of holiness, but for us to be truly holy, we have to make it to the end. That's why St. Paul says that we have to prepare ourselves to go to the stadium, as if we were going around into Olympics. But then how do you prepare? You prepare as a good athlete. You have to have a great discipline and conviction. 
and to be focused on winning, but not as if winning a temporary crown, but as if winning an eternal crown. That's our race. And we have to be ready to run the race in that fashion. So today we will think about this, like who am I? Who am I right now? Where is my treasure? Is my treasure all earthly? Because sometimes if you look inside yourself and you find out what is it that I'm treasuring right now? Is it a human being, the most important thing in my life? Is it money? Is it my dreams? My, my ideas, my ideals, like what, I, what I'm aiming to achieve in my life, what is it? What is my biggest treasure? And then if I find that my biggest treasures are earthly, all of them are earthly, then I'm just an earthly human being. I'm not living an eternal life. I'm not within the new times. I am in the old times. I am in the Old Testament. I haven't crossed over into the New Testament. I haven't embraced the gift of Christ. Because I'm still a plain, simple, earthly human being. That's all I am. Because I am focused only on earthly life. So that's why we have this, this, uh, this uh, hybrid Christianity. See, this, this Christianity without roots. That is the Christianity of prosperity and health. And, and that people love that Christianity. But today, when you find yourself facing within you a reality that will tell you who you are in relationship with the gospel you might find out that in spite of you being so religious you might be probably just a human being that is totally earthly because you see if you die right now what is the, your biggest worry what is your biggest worry while you're sitting here your debts your money that you want to get the friendships you lost the affection that you want to get or what is it that is your main thing in your life that worries you the most today right, while you're sitting here? Because I tell you, you could die right now. So what are you going to take? You're going to take with you your biggest worry. That's what you're going to take with you. Probably if you get what I'm saying, now you understand the nature of purgatory, right? Why is purgatory a purgatory? Because if your treasure is your biggest worry, then that's what you become at the end of this life. That's a very difficult purgatory. Because then you have to learn to let go of that worry and to turn God into your main concern. See, your biggest worry today should be, and should be all the time, how much do you love God? That should be your worry. The only one. Should, you shouldn't have another one. And how do you do that? You do that by translating and turning your life into God, everything. It's like you have problems with money. Then you say, well, I must take the wrong decisions. Then now I am in terrible trouble, right? Because of my wrong decisions. So you ask forgiveness from God. You ask, you ask enlightenment. You repent. And you promise God you never do it again the wrong way. And you're going to change your ways. And then you face the music, the consequences of your wrong decisions. But now your worries about money and your wrong decisions are not the leading factor in your life. The leading factor in your life is your repentance, your reconciliation with God, your conscience, because you now accept that you took the wrong decisions, and then now you're paying for that. So that now life changes around, because then it's not your worries anymore about what you did wrong. It's your worries about what you did wrong against God. So that changes life. That's life changing. And we have to turn things around like that. See, relationships, they fall apart. Sometimes I don't get along with my husband anymore, with my wife, with my children, with my parents, with my friends. They fall apart. So what do you do? Sometimes we can find that, that the other is the, the one that is guilty, right? But the best way to find it is that I am guilty. That is the best way. Why? Because if there is any solution to do to make things right, it's when you start with yourself. It's the best way. Because if you wait, for it to start with the other, then it's probably never going to happen. Because that person will probably never be interested to change it. What if, what if that person doesn't want to? So I have to start with myself. And when I start with myself, I will have the wisdom to know what to do. Because God will give me enlightenment. So every time we, we hope and wait for others to change, before we change, we lose. Because we're not walking on the path of love. The path of love is I change, so therefore I think right. 
Therefore, I am enlightened, and God will dwell in me, filling me with wisdom, and that wisdom will tell me what to do. So my treasure right now has to be my concern about how much of God am I. That should be my treasure. And that should be my treasure all the time. I should be concerned about, will God like this? Is this the way God wants me to think, to feel? See, sometimes we are really down, blue. We are depressed, confused. Things are not working right. And we, we have two ways to go. One, we harden our hearts and become indifferent. Then we don't care anymore about anything. Too many dead people in this world. It's like walking dead bodies, you know. We, we see people in this world that are so indifferent. They are just like dead people. And you know why they became indifferent? Because at the end, they never made it to get what they want. So they end up not caring about anything. So they just walk all over people. They just don't care about themselves either. And they just become like monsters. And there are too many of those in the world. And the other way is when you decide to really make sense about your direction in life and say, I think I'm acting wrong, I'm focusing on the wrong, I am expecting too much from life, and I have to just let go and let God and begin to be real. Begin to know that it's not about what I want, it's about what God wants. And what God wants is me to be holy. God doesn't want anything else. You know, a lot of people try to find the will of God in a lot of ways. But there's only one way. Jesus told us. He said, God wants us to be holy. That's all he wants. So, like I said before, the path of holiness should be our path. And the fullness of holiness should be the embracing of the crown at the end of this life. So, just know this. We are all here together. Before the Lord Jesus, God called us here today to reflect upon these mysteries. But he knows and we know that we are far from making it yet. But all we want is to make it. So what counts is what I want, not what I am right now. What counts is what is it that you're striving for. That's what counts before the tribunal of the Lord. If you die today, the Lord is not going to judge you for what you are missing what you didn't make. He's not going to judge you because you still are not perfect. He's not going to judge you because you are not as holy as you know that you need it to be. He's only going to judge you on love, which means he's going to judge you in how much you truly decided to be good. And that's what counts. It's like when you have a son and the son is going to school and you see the son is studying like crazy all the time and he fails. He doesn't make the grade. He comes back home. If you know that that son is working so hard at trying to make that grade, you will only have compassion for your son. You will never punish him thinking he didn't study, he didn't do right. He worked and he did and he provided all his efforts to make the grade. So therefore you're going to have compassion. It's not about making the grade. It's about working hard enough because that's all you wanted to do, to make the grade. And that's God with us. We are going to be judged like that. Because God is not going to ask us, why didn't you become perfect? He's going to ask us, who, if, what was it that we really wanted to do? And what we wanted to do was to become perfect. Then we have the perfect judgment, right? Because God knows that perfection begins with decisions. I decide to be perfect, therefore I'm perfect before God. See, though I am not yet. But still, I am perfect before God because God knows that I truly want to be perfect. So before a perfect God, what does it mean? It means perfection because I'm thinking perfectly, though I am not perfect yet. So that's what it means. It's like, it's like couples, a marriage. Sometimes a husband and a wife have crises, have problems. So the love they have for one another allows them to understand their weaknesses. And they say, though you're not perfect, though you don't love me right, I know that in your heart, you do love me right, though you don't perform right. See, but that is true love. That is God's love in us. We forgive, and then we live. Because then, with forgiveness, we have God in ourselves. And then we go along with the imperfections as if we were perfect. Because our love within us 
tells us that perfection is the way to go. So therefore we forgive imperfections. And that's God. And we have to understand this gift. Because if we don't understand this gift, we will always be in trouble with people. We will always be in trouble with ourselves and in trouble with God. Because we will always be judging people. Judging self and judging God at the same time. So today, to embrace the, the gift of the new times, we have to confront ourselves thinking about what is the real treasure in my heart. Because you see, a lot of people spend their whole lives worrying. They are warriors. They are always worrying about everything. And you know why they worry? Because they are so full of themselves, so much self-love. All they want is to get what they want. That's all they want, to get what they desire. So they are all about want and desire. They are miserable human beings because there's no way you could ever get what you want the way you want. You see, we all get what we want, never how we want it. See, so therefore we never do. So when we do focus on God, then we do get what we are to get, not what we want to get. So God will provide to us perfection. He will give us exactly what we need and what we are to have. And that is the beginning of peace, the beginning of joy. True joy only begins with true gifts. And true gifts only come from God, not from my ideas. Not from my want and desire. Everyone that focuses on these earthly goals and trying to make a great, wonderful, abundant, prosperous life, they all end up wrong. They all end up bad, miserable. Because greed, you know, ambitions of this world are never going to take you to God. They always lead you astray. They always get you to hurt people. They always get you to lie. They always get you to lie to yourself, beginning with that. Because in order to lie to people, you have to convince yourself of your own lies. That way, if you don't lie with conviction, then you are not a good liar, right? So good liars are those that lie to themselves. See, because then they make everybody believe their own lives. That, that's, that's the nature of a false prophet. See, a false prophet convinces everybody because he's convinced of his own false prophecies. See, false visionaries are the same. They believe what they see, though they don't see anything, right? And that's false prophecy, false visionaries. And they speak with conviction because they are convinced of their own lies. So a good liar is a pathological liar, someone that knows their lies and believes in them, though they are lies. And that is a horrible life. And then we see that, and who believes them? Those that are walking on the same path. Those that are walking to become pathological also in that sense. So today, if God wants to talk to us, he will talk straight to our hearts and say, who are you? What is in your heart? Who are you? Who are really, who is, who is dwelling in your heart for real? Are you just an earthly human being? Or are you really existing within the new times of Jesus Christ, which is freedom, true freedom? When we let go of all this earthly dwelling and embrace material life as a great gift, temporary gift, but an amazing gift, because this is the beginning of an amazing construction. We are building here an eternal life. Imagine how large it is, but we have to focus on the eternal life not to focus on the temporary one. Though the temporary one is leading us to the eternal one. So we treat the temporary life as a treasure, but we are not attached to it. Because one thing we have to do is to learn how to let go of it. How are we going to really shoot this rocket into the sky of God when, when we are not going to be able to let go of the ground that is going to shoot that rocket up? See, we, we have to prepare ourselves building the foundation in the right direction. A lot of people are attached to earthly life in so many ways. So at the end of this life, no rocket is going to go up. I always, I always give people an example of funerals. Sometimes we go into a funeral and everybody is looking down like this, really down. So you feel like some, someone went down. Sometimes we go to a funeral and everybody is looking up. Maybe they are not blowing with happiness because they are sad. Someone they love is gone. So it's a sense of sadness, but it's a holy sadness. You're looking up because that person went up. It's like when you go, when you see John Paul II's funeral, everybody was looking up. There were tears everywhere, 
but they were looking with tears of joy, you know, in a way. We miss him, but we know he went up like a rocket, like this. Something took off. His soul took off. But sometimes we go to funerals where we know that soul didn't take off. See, it feels heavy. And the funeral is heavy. And we have to focus on that. We have to understand that we have to prepare our soul so that at the end of this life, our funeral will be one where everybody's going to be looking up. Everybody's going to be looking up. They will probably have tears, but they will be looking, looking up because you went up. And how could you go up? You could only go up if you let go of this earthly life in the right way. By understanding it, treasuring it, it's like parents with children. How will parents be good parents when they are not attached to the children? When they truly love them and they raise them for God, they, they teach them to be good, and they give them the opportunities to be good people, but one day they know they have to leave the nest. They have to fly away like the bird. They have to push them off the nest, and they go into the realm of God, and that's a good parent. But a good parent is not those, is not that parent that is trying to hold into the children, you know, hold back into them, just grab them and then tell them what to do and just try to place their will in the children. Those are not good parents at all. A lot of parents want the children to be doctors and to be this and the other and they almost force them into that direction. And at the end, they never let them go. They always possess them and manipulate them and demand from them so many things. God is not like that. See, God created us, and He's not showing up every day to tell us what He's giving us. God is not showing up in the kitchen to tell us He's giving us food. He's not showing up in the closet telling us He gives us clothing. And He's not showing up in our health telling us that He's making it possible for us to survive more years in this earth. Never. He never takes that into account. He just gives and gives. And that's what we have to learn. We're in the silence of giving, we build our eternal salvation in that silence of giving. So we have to give unconditionally, love unconditionally, and then don't think about anything else. Because you see, the greatest thing to do is to give unconditionally. Because then we don't remember we gave. There's nothing better in life than when someone comes and tells you, how much they have benefit from what you do and you don't even remember what you gave them, right? So they have to remind you and tell you what it was because you don't know. Because you never gave anything expecting anyone to tell you what, it, what they felt and what, they, what it did to their lives. Because you gave it because you wanted to give it. And there's no, no strings attached. You just give it. And you forget that you gave. And that is the only way to do. See, when you marry... And everything you're doing for your husband or your wife has a strings attached. Then if your husband or your wife are not really acknowledging your gifts, then you're going to be mad one day and there's going to be a crisis in your marriage. Because you're going to demand your husband or your wife to acknowledge everything you're doing for them. And that's the end of a relationship. Because that's not unconditional giving. That is just a conditional gift. And that doesn't have any life because it doesn't have God in it. It doesn't have true love. So if I give truly, I never expect anything back. Therefore, I'm never offended. I'm never confused. Because I don't expect others to perform the way I give. No, I give and forget. And therefore, I truly give. And then God is in my gift. God is in my giving. And that God being in my giving is life. True life that will never end. Life that is for real life, true life. And that's how much we can measure ourselves. You could now measure yourself. Think about this. All the people that, has, that have offended you through your life, they probably have offended you because they didn't perform for you. Because they didn't respond to what you gave them. You expected them to give you so much, they didn't, therefore you are troubled with them. But if you think about true giving, then people will never offend you. You will never have problems with people because you don't expect them to perform the level of your giving. So if I give unconditionally, whatever people do to me are never going to offend me because I wasn't expecting them to be grateful, to be thankful, and to come back and acknowledge what I gave them. 
Therefore, I'm never offended because they could never offend me because I'm not expecting anything from them. But every time I give and I give conditionally, I'm always offended because people will never be grateful enough to, to thank me and gratify me for what I gave them. Therefore, I'm always frustrated, I'm always angry, I'm, I'm always blue, I never have hope because I think everything goes wrong and that's the way it is with business, that's the way it is with any relationship with God and people, that is the way it goes with self. Sometimes you end up not trusting self at all, which is good because it's a rule of perfection, right? The, the teachings of the church tell us that we should never trust ourselves, but at the same time, God teaches us in another way that we should get our safety in God in order to have conviction. Meaning, the conviction we gain is not that we trust ourselves, it's that we trust God in us. And therefore, God dwelling in us is the leading force. So we end up having a conviction that doesn't come from taking for granted what we think. It comes from faith from understanding that God's teaching in my heart, because I'm obedient, is leading me the way to do goodness. And that type of conviction doesn't come from trusting self. It comes from trusting God in me, by me being faithful to God, and God dwelling in me. And that is so important to have clear, because it's the only way to walk with God. So God comes along and says, you see, the only thing you have to provide to me is to be mine, for you to be mine. The rest I will do. So it's like he, was, he will tell St. Teresa of Avila. He will say, you do my job and I do yours. See, her job was to be faithful to him. And he will take care of everything that Therese will do. She wanted to open another convent. He will provide that, everything. She will have to do the job, but he will open the doors. And he will make it possible. So she was doing his job. And then he was doing her job. Her job, the job he was doing for her was keeping her going with faith, with a zeal for the church, with all of that. That was what God was giving her, the strength to go and fight, not to be disheartened, not to doubt. That was what God was giving her back. And, he, and she was doing his job that was going out and bringing the gospel, the reformation of the Carmelites and going to open more convents. And he was giving her that fire. See, so that was a great relationship between the two. So we have to learn that relationship with God. I give myself to God and God will do my job because I'm doing His. And mine is to give myself to Him, to be faithful. As simple as that, if I'm faithful, if, if I'm a true, simple parishioner, as I was telling you in the first reflection today, that is all God wants from us. Because the rest God will do, absolutely will do. Absolutely, every little thing will do. But the, the moment we think we are the ones doing it, like the donkey of Palm Sunday, right? <laughs> then we'll never make it, because we will never acknowledge Jesus on top of the donkey, right? So the party is for the Lord. The party is always for the Lord. All the welcoming palms and all the people shouting and, 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 and praising is for God, always. People, you could come up here and preach beautifully, and touch people's hearts and do great things. Pray, people will be healed and things will happen. So, if you're not careful, you end up thinking it's you. That's the end of you. The end of preaching, the end of the apostle, the dying of the apostle, the killing of the gospel. Because you have to remember you're just a donkey, right? All the time, all the time. You have to remember, it's not you. It's God doing it through you. And you have to remember always that we praise the Lord because he's on top. He's writing. He's the writer. He's the one on top. He's the one pulling the rims. And, and we have to understand that all the time. When we understand that, we are okay. Because God is on us and he's leading the way. We go like a child through the crowds. You know, when a child is holding the, the father's hand, going through the crowds, the child is afraid as this, but is safe in a way always. Because that hand is pulling the child. So the child goes through all these emotions through the crowds. Some areas scare him. Some areas attract him. Some areas are indifferent. Some others are really strange. Whatever it is, you go through the crowds just holding that hand. And then you know you're safe. Though your feelings sometimes are not exactly as safe 
as you will want them, but still you go through them. You never stop, you are safe. Once you let go of the hand, then you are in trouble. Because you're stuck in the crowd. And you, in whatever happens that is wrong, you're not going to be able to go through. Because no hand is pulling you. So you're stuck. Because you don't have the strength to go through the, through the places where are uh, wrong, scary, difficult, confused. Because you have no one to pull you. So that's why we have to grab the hand of the Father. The, God, the hand of God. And let him pull you like a child. And never stop being a child. That's why Jesus said, only if you become like children, you will make it. So we have to always grab the hand of the Father. But you know, how long can we grab the hand of the Father Almighty? Only as long as we behave like children. But when we think we know too much, when we think we are so wise, so intelligent, now we, we decide for ourselves, we let go of the hand, we are in a mess. We never make it like that. Because we are not grown up enough to make it on our own. We will not be until we go from here, until this is over. So, I could speak about this forever, but we have a mass at 4 o'clock. So I better begin closing down, and I'm going to ask the Lord to give us a word so we can close these reflections. And I'm going to read to you from Luke 9... 51, and it says, Jesus unwelcome in a Samaritan village. As the time drew near when Jesus would be taken up to heaven, he made up his mind to go to Jerusalem. He had sent ahead of him some messengers who entered a Samaritan village to prepare a lodging for him. But the people would not receive him because he was on his way to Jerusalem. Seeing this, James and John, his disciples, said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to reduce them to ashes? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. The word of the Lord. So that's a good example of who we are. That's what we want to do, right? To turn everybody into ashes when they don't do the things God wants them to do. But God turns around and says, no, that's not the way we do things. You know, we have to love them and forgive them and understand them. It's not about they doing what we want them to do. It's about us loving them, regardless of what they do, in spite of it all. And that is the real teaching of God in our lives. So we praise the Lord for that. I thank the Lord for the opportunity I had to share with you this afternoon. Uh, I'm sure that we will remain together in this path of holiness. And I really pray and hope that we all become holy so that we can see each other forever. Amen.